I want to kind of do a little demonstration with the data file first before we really dive into this. Okay, so I've got a data file here. It's called cumulative fuel.txt. So I'm going to go ahead and double click it and just kind of look and see what's in it. And what we've got is a single column of numbers out to a good, good hearty bunch of decimal places. Then we've got a text label on the top, cumulative fuel consumption pounds. Okay. So just kind of quick scrolling through here, we got a bunch of numbers. We have 763 rows in this, or lines in this file. That means we have 762 uh, values because one of those lines is this label. So I want to load this file into MATLAB. So I'm going to create a new script for this. We'll call it um, data demo. Okay. And the first thing I'll do in here is uh, get everything going here. Clear all, close all, CLC. Okay, now I want to read in that file. So uh, that file was a mixture of numbers and text. So that means I got to use import data to read it. So. We'll do that. Okay, so the second line there is just get actually extracting the data. I'm calling it FCONS for fuel consumption. Okay, so now I've got, if I run this, I'll hit run just to kind of show you what shows up in the workspace. So when I run this, I should end up with, and I do end up with a variable called FCONS, and it's a 762 row and one column uh, vector. That's what I was expecting. So now that I have this data, um, there's lots of things we can do with it, data analysis-wise, but this is always kind of where we'll get started. And um, this is something you'll see on the next homework assignment is uh, you actually see this data file that we're looking at. So let's say I want to make a plot of the data. I just want to take the raw data and see what it looks like. So with 762 numbers, I'm not going to be terribly interested in looking at the numbers directly. That's a lot of numbers doesn't tell me much. But a nice way to look at it is to make a plot of the data. So here's how we might do that. Uh, the first thing, and this kind of gets us to the first page of the notes that hopefully you just downloaded. I'll bring that up on the screen here. Hold on a second. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is called the figure window. So the command for a figure window is figure. What this is going to do, what the figure command does is it opens a figure window and then you can start creating plots inside that window. So we'll switch back to MATLAB and I'll show you how the figure command works. So I'm going to jump straight into just in the command window for now. If I type figure and nothing else and hit enter, this will create a figure window. It'll number that window. So it'll be uh, ordinal numbers. And it'll pick the first available unused number. So right now I have no figures. So if I type figure and hit enter, this should give me a window named figure one. And it does. So here's my new figure window, figure one. Put that here. Now, if I run the figure command again, it's going to give me a new figure window. But this time, it's going to pick the first available unused number. So now, I already have used figure one. So this should give me another figure called figure two. And here it is, figure two. So now I've got my two figure windows, figure one and figure two. Let's say I don't want to call them one or two. I can assign it a number as well. So let's go back here. 
So I can type the figure command, figure, and then in parentheses, I can give it a number. So let's say I want figure 144. So I put the number in parentheses, hit enter. And now I got another figure window. This one's called figure 144. So that's the first use of the figure command. You can use it to create new figure windows. And you can create them. You can give them whatever number you want. It's got to be a number. So you can't call it figure A, figure B, anything like that. You got to give it a number. But um, you can tell it explicitly what number you want using a command like this, figure 144. Or you can just use figure without a number, and it will create a new figure window with the next available unused number. So if I do just figure again, I should get figure three. And I do figure three. OK, so with the figure command, just the word figure alone creates a new figure window with the next available unused figure number. Figure with a number in parentheses if that number does not already exist, the figure command will create a figure with that number. So that was our figure 144 that we created. Now, if the figure does exist, the figure command with that number will switch to, and make it the active figure. So let's say I want to go back to figure 1. So if I type the figure 1 command and hit Enter, now it does not create a new figure window. It, it goes to the existing figure one here and just makes it the active figure window. So now anything I do, any commands that I issue that might put something into that window will work with figure one. So let me show you what I mean by that. So currently my active figure is figure one. I'm going to close all these and just kind of start over again. So by the way, that's another thing I should talk about here. We have all these figure windows, figure one, figure two, figure three, figure 144. If I want to get rid of any of those, that's what the close command is for. So I can type close 144, and this will make figure 144 go away. So I don't know how well you can see it in my uh, lower status bar here. I've got figure one, figure two, figure 144, figure three. You won't be able to see it on my screen disappear, but if I do close 144, this should go away. So now it's gone. Now, if I want to close all of the figures at the same time, close all. We've already heard of close all. We put that at the beginning of all of our scripts. But what that does is it takes all these open figure windows and makes them go away. And now they're gone. OK. So let's create some figure windows again. Let's start here. So I want a figure of one and another one, like figure two. OK, so when you run these, it creates the figure and it makes it your active figure window. So anything I do right now is going to show up in figure two. So let's make a plot. Let's just plot the data here. I'll do a very simple plot. So if you have a list of values and you want to put them on a, on a line plot, Type the word plot and then the variable. So my variable here is fcons for fuel consumption. So if I plot fcons, this should plot into figure two. And here it is. Now let's say I wanted to put that in figure one. So figure one is still this empty window. So I can go back to my command window here and I can type figure one like this. Now, figure one is my active figure window, and I can make my plot there instead. So I could do plot fcons, and it'll plot in figure one now. Whoops, I made an error here. Plot fcon. There we go, plot fcons. Now it should be in figure one. And it is. So I've got it now saved in both of these figures. So the figure command, again, I'll talk about plot in a few minutes, but the figure command is basically a way to switch back and forth and switch to different figure windows so you can work in different windows. If you use a figure command on a figure window that doesn't, does not exist, 
it will create it for you. If you just use the figure command by itself, it will create a figure with the next unused figure number. So the figure command has basically two functions. One function is to create new figure windows. The other function is a switch from your current figure window to another existing figure window. So when you create figures, the figure command, again, creates a brand new figure window with the next available unused number. If you include a number, so if you do figure and then one in parentheses, it'll create a figure with that number if it does not already exist. If it does already exist, it will switch that to be your active figure. So any figure type commands that you use will then be applied to whatever the current window is. We'll revisit this in a little bit. Any questions so far? Okay, back to Dr. Lopez's notes here. Okay, so that's the first page of the notes here, talking about the figure command. This next part kind of talks a little bit about what kinds of plots you can make. So the command we just used was plot, P-L-O-T. Plot creates a line graph, a two-dimensional line graph. There are a number of ways you can do this. You can just simply plot your data like we just did. Um, for that case, all you do is all you have to do is provide um, a vector containing all your values to the plot command. So for our case, we plotted F cons. Um, you can also provide both X and Y values. If you do not provide x values, it'll, if you just provide one, uh, one of these variables here, it will assume that those are your y values. And it will assign integer values as x. So if you give it, uh, let's say you give it 10 values, but you don't tell it what the y values are, it will just assume the y values are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 to go along with whatever I'm sorry, your x values are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, to go along with whatever y values you provide. If you want to provide explicit x values, then you can do that as well. When you, put, when you provide both x and y values, you have to have the same number of x values as you have y values, because you're plotting a series of points. When you're plotting points on an xy uh, xy field, you have to provide both the x and the y values. So these have to have the same number of points. So if you have 10 x's, you need 10 y's. If you have 20 y's, you need to have 20 x's. Those have to match. Otherwise, MATLAB doesn't know what to do with it. There's a few other types of plots you can make. You can make bar graphs. Um, we can actually, let's switch over to our MATLAB window here. I have, I have a line plot of this data, both in figure one and figure two. Let's make a bar plot of the data in figure two instead. So I'm going to switch my active figure window now to figure two. So here's what's in there now. And now I'm going to replace this with a bar plot. So I'll say the command is bar. And then again, you can just provide the X values or just the Y values if you want. Now, if I look at my figure two, it looks like this. So I've got a line plot and a bar plot. The bar plot, uh, at this zoom level, it's tough to see because there's you know 762 values. You can actually zoom in. I'm just using the scroll wheel in my figure here to zoom in. So I can kind of see these are actually small bar plot, small, small bars in my plot. Um, so there's a lot of point and click stuff you can do inside your figure window involving zooming and unzooming and resetting things. 
So I invite you to click around in here uh, at your leisure when we do some of this stuff here. But so that, that makes a bar plot. So line plot, bar plot. Bar plot, the command is bar. The line plot, the command is plot. Okay. Let's do a couple other examples here of our plotting demonstration. I'm going to close these. I'm going to go back to our window here. So you don't have to switch back and forth between your different plotting windows if you put everything in a script. I was doing a bunch of, I do a bunch of stuff in the command window just to try stuff out. And sometimes if I want to just do a quick check of my data, I'll do some plots from the command window. But you can really kind of formalize everything in a script. So what I'm going to do is this. For my plotting demonstration, I'm going to create a figure. I'm going to let it assign the first available number, which is going to be one. Since I've got the close all up here, I have no figures when I run this. So the first available number will be one. In figure one, I'm going to make a line plot of this fuel consumption data, FCONS. Then I'll create another figure, or I'll make a bar plot of the same data. So everything we just did already, I formalized it in the script. Now it's saved. So none of this ends up happening until I hit run. So let's go ahead and hit run. And my two plots should pop up on the screen here. So I have my figure one's the line plot, figure two's the bar plot. So let's say you want to plot an equation instead. So this is plotting data. This is data you've read in off a file. But you can also uh, plot equations. So when you plot an equation, what MATLAB's doing when it's making a plot, it's not actually, like, with a, we'll talk line plot first. It's not actually plotting a line. So when we make this line plot of our data here, we're not actually, it doesn't actually plot the line. What it's plotting is a series of individual points. And then those individual points, it draws the line in between them. So it's actually doing connect the dots for you, but it's actually just plotting the individual points. So if you want to make a plot of an equation, what you're going to do is plot individual points on that equation. So an equation is typically going to be an XY type of thing. So we can start off just do a simple straight line. So the equation for a straight line is y equals mx plus b. Um, let's just kind of pick some. So our slope is going to be 2.4. And our y-intercept is going to be 5. So this is our equation here. Now, in order to... Um, actually calculate these y values, we got to provide x values. So you can provide them one at a time if you wanted to. You could use a for loop to do it that way. Or you can, in this case, we can just give it a bunch of x values. So my x values, I want to plot this equation for a line. I want to start off at uh, negative 2. I want to go in increments of tenths, and I want to end up at 10. So what I'm doing right here is I'm actually providing all the x values. So I'm creating x values that are going to start at negative 2 and go to 10 and count by tenths. So this should give me uh, what 121 values, I believe, including 0. So now I'm taking these x values and plugging them into this equation here to get y values. So if I hit run, besides printing these plots that we've already seen, we now have created an x array that contains 121 values and then a y array that's calculated from that. So now if I want to plot those, I can do so. So I'll create a new figure and then in that figure, I'm going to make a plot of my x values and my y values. 
Now again, this is actually going to be plotting just points and then drawing lines in between them. Uh, the default is to just draw lines, but we could actually plot this with the individual points as well. So I'm going to hit run. We'll see what this figure looks like. So it's a straight line, which is, I think, what we'd ex what we would expect for plotting the equation of a line. But we had to provide all those x values. So if we go back and change the x values here, so instead of going from negative two to ten, let's just go from five to ten. So if I hit run again, if you watch the workspace, we'll see that x and y become smaller arrays. We're only 51 now. We still plot the line, but now the x values only go from 5 to 10 instead of negative 2 to 10. So we've got fewer x values. That actually looks like a line, but it turns out we're actually just plotting points. So I'll show you what that looks like, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we're going to do that. So I'm going to, instead of plotting by point, by tenths, I'll just plot by ones. And then I'm going to actually have it show you the points instead of what we're looking at here. So we'll plot those as asterisks, and then we'll hit that. So this is the actual plot. It's showing asterisks now as individual points. So MATLAB's automatically connecting the dots. But the only x values we're using now are 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So it calculates the y value, so it knows where to put the point. But we have one at 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So we can add the line in between them. So that draws the line. But we aren't actually plotting any of the points on this line. We're only plotting the individual values. So we can make a more complex equation. So I've got uh, 2.4x plus 5. Let's make this a quadratic. So let's do um, x squared. So if I plot this, let's go back to just plotting the line here. So now we're plotting a parabola. If you look carefully at this picture, I'll make it larger so you can see it better. If you look carefully, you can see there's a bit of chalk in between each value. Um, let me plot this on a different scale so it's easier to see that. So instead of going from 5 to 10, let's go from negative 2 to 2. So now you can see it's individual line segments in between the points. If I go ahead and add the um, add the point markers, you'll be able to see that very well, I think. So this is our parabola with our individual points. Now we can change the resolution here. All right, you know, we'll go back to our plot here. Instead of going by ones, we'll go by 0 0.01. So now we're going by hundreds. Oops. And this should show a much smoother picture. It's still plotting the individual points, but it's a much smoother curve. If I take the individual points out and just plot the lines, it'll look nice. When you're making plots, I generally suggest doing it um, as a script. That way you can go through and make small changes as you go. 
rather than having to redo everything in the command window. So command window is good for a quick and dirty plot if you just want to take a quick look at your data. But if you're actually making a plot that you want to modify, do it, do it as a script and hit run. That way you can make modifications nice and easily. Okay, so again, when you're making plots of equations, you need to provide x values, y values, and then you can plot x versus y. So it's important to provide both your x and y values when you're plotting an equation. Questions so far? Okay, so a couple of other things we can plot here. There are a couple other types of plots. I'll bring up the notes again. We talked about uh, 2D line graphs. We talked about bar graphs. We can also do a few different kinds of three-dimensional plots. So you can make a 3D plot of a curve when you have x, y, and z values. You have to provide all of the x, y, and z values. The command for that is plot3. And then we can make 3D surface plots as well. So I'll show you a 3D surface plot. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of where I have good data for that. Um, So I'm actually going to generate some 3D data real quick, and then I'll um, I'll make a plot of it. This will take, I think, about 10 seconds to run. Once this is complete, I can show you a couple of these type of surface plot values here. So, OK, so I'll show you a surface plot, and then I'll show you a mesh plot. They kind of do the same thing. But a surface plot looks like this. So let's give it a new figure. So this is going to be in figure four. So to make a surface plot, you have to provide x, y, and z values, or just the z values. So that's all I'm doing here. I'm not providing x and y. This makes what's called a surface plot. And a surface plot looks kind of like this. So we have an x-axis and a y-axis, so probably x and y. That's going to give you um, the locations. And the z-axis provides the depth of this surface. <clears throat> Okay. Calculus 3 vibes. Yeah, that's kind of where this kind of stuff comes from. Um, if you end up taking 3800 with me, you'll be generating plots that look like this. In fact, that's what 3800 is doing right now, is making these. Okay. So this is a surface plot. That's one way you can look at a three-dimensional data set. So a three-dimensional data set in this case is just a uh, XY grid. And then on that XY grid, you have values everywhere. So in this case, the values are um, the uh, elevation of the water table. So this is a, from a hydrology problem. We can look at it in a couple different ways. So another type of plot we can make, that was a surface plot. The command is surf. You can also make a mesh plot. So a mesh plot is going to do something pretty similar. I'll bring that up on the screen now. So we're getting basically the same plot, but the mesh is just drawing the grid, whereas the um, surface plot actually fills in the grid squares. So on the surface plot, 
Let me bring up both real quick. If I can show you together. Okay, so here's our, this is our surface plot in figure five and our mesh plot in figure four. So in the surface plot, the entire, the grid on here is painted black. And then the faces, or the squares in between, those are painted in a color that is represented by a color bar. So different levels provide a different color. On the left in figure four, instead of using colored faces, it uses colored grid lines to represent the same data. So same plot, two different ways. Here's a third way we could look at something like that. We'll call it figure six. So in this figure, you could also look at it just in map view by making what's called an image plot. So you can plot H as an image plot in figure six. So then we can look at it. This is looking at it from above. So all these are plotting the same data, but looking at them in different ways. And in fact, you can also make a contour map. So let me show you a contour map. We'll give that a new figure name. Figure, the command for a contour map is contour, conveniently enough. So here's looking at all that data as a contour map. Again, for this particular data set, the contour map doesn't show much. But you're basically looking at this, these two are looking at the same data using different mapping techniques. Okay, so that's kind of just a little introduction into what type of plots you can make. Um, and there's different ways you can set this up. So with our surface and mesh plots, the way it's listed here in the notes, um, it actually, um, you can provide the X values, the Y values, and the Z values for both mesh and surface plots. Um, so that way, you know, if your X and Y values are not just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, um, you can provide them. But at a minimum, you need to provide the Z values. So that's the actual value you're trying to plot. The same goes for um, our 2D line graphs. You have to provide at a minimum one set of values to plot. And MATLAB will make some assumptions for additional values. OK. Ah, here's a good one. Hold on, hold all. So, so far, let's go back to just our line plot here. So far, we've printed one line in um, in a in a plot. Let's say you want to plot two different things in the same plot. That is possible. Here's how. So we'll go back here. I'm going to go back to my plotting equations here. We'll do multiple plots in the same figure, or multiple lines in the same plot. So we'll create a new figure here. I'll create some x values. So this one is going to go from 0 by 0 point. Let's go by. Uh, over 12 to pi. So we're doing something that's going to involve uh, trig. We're going to do sine function. OK, so my y values here are going to be the sine of my x values. And then I want to make a plot of that. So my x, y plot here. So I'll hit plot. What happened here? Whoops, whoops. Sorry about that. OK, 
that one comes up right. Okay, so I've created a bunch of figures here. So this is the one that I'm interested in now. So I've plotted the sine wave from 0 to 2 pi with increments of pi over 12. I'm actually going to change my increment here. Instead of doing pi over 12, I'm going to do pi over 60. So that'll make it a smoother curve. So let's hit run real quick, then we'll bring these back up on the screen. There you go. So that's a nice smooth curve. Now, let's say I want to also plot the cosine on this uh, plot as well. So I've got my plot x, y here. I can add a line here, hold on. What this is going to do is now it's going to have my plot waiting for another plot command. So now I can enter the next plot command. So I'm going to use the same x values, but this time instead of the y values, I want to plot the cosine of x. So you can set it up like this as well. You don't have to explicitly define y. You can do that in your plot command. So something like that. So now if I hit run, I should get two plots in the same window. All right, so here's that sine wave that I plotted before. And now I've also got the cosine plotted in here, too. So now I was able to plot two plots on the same pair of axes. And you can do as many as you want. So I could add a hold on at the end of this line here. And I can actually plot the tangent as well. Hit run again. Got my parentheses right. Uh, I don't like the way that looks. I shouldn't have done the tangent. That was a poor choice. So let's go back here and try something different. So I plotted the sine, the cosine. Let's do um, I don't know. I always like to do trigonometric functions because it comes out looking cool. Uh, let's do the secant. That'll be something different. Uh, secant was a bad choice, too. See, now we're getting into trig that I don't understand as well. It's been a while since I found that with trigon trigonometry, it's actually pretty rare that I look at anything besides the sine and the cosine of the tangent. We have cotangent, secant, cosecant, all that stuff, but I actually don't ever find myself using those for much of anything. All right. So instead of that, let's do uh, let's do the sine of 2x. I don't know that'll work. Well, that's a little fun fun game to see how well I know trigonometry. Apparently not that well. Uh, okay, so now you've got a third plot on here as well. So we've got our original sine plot. We have our cosine plot. And then this is the sine of 2x. Again, still going out to 2 pi. So the hold on command you can use to allow you to add more plots after. There's also a command called hold all. So if you use hold on, you have to put hold on after each line that you want to plot in your plot window. Um, if you don't want to keep typing hold on, so let's say you're putting a lot of different plots, you can also instead do hold all. Then get rid of that hold on. And then instead of hold on, I'll do hold all. 
So I hit run now. This should print. This should print the same plot, but I only had to type hold all once after the first plot. Yeah, so that works just fine. All right. Any questions so far? Okay. Back to the notes here. So that's hold on, hold all. Okay, so a little bit about formatting. You can take a little bit of control of what your plot line plot looks like. So um, you can control the color using one of these codes. You can control the shape of your um, individual point markers using these codes. I've been using the star. But you can easily use any of these other type of markers for individual values. And then this last one does the style of the line. And the way these are specified is in your plot command. So let's go back to the plot command and I'll show you how we specify these. And by the way, you can specify them in any order you want. You can do uh, color, marker, line style. You can do line style, color, marker. You can do uh, marker, line style, color, whatever order you want. And you don't even have to include all of these. There's defaults. So the default color is blue for the first line. And MATLAB automatically starts cycling through some of the other colors as you add plots. So um, you don't have to specify a color, but if you want a particular color, you can. The default is blue for the first line. The marker, the default for the marker is no marker at all. So this is by default left blank. That's what we've been doing with, say, this figure here. This has a blue line, an orange line, and a yellow line. I guess this is a red line, not an orange line. Uh, that MATLAB picked those automatically, but you can actually pick it yourself instead. Uh, the marker, there are no markers here. And then the line style is a solid line. So I'll show you how we enter that when we make our plots here. So back on this window, let's say for my first one, um, well, let's first change our resolution. Let's um, do this every, what, I want to say 60 degrees, so pi over 3 works. Now, for my markers, I'm just going to do it on this first line for now. To specify your marker, after your x and y, so x is then y separated by commas, put another comma, and then in single quotes, you can specify your uh, formatting stuff here. So let's say instead of making it a blue line, I want it to be a black line. So the code for black was k, right? Yeah, the code for black is k. I want to make individual markers. I want them to be um, circles. So I'm going to plot black circles. And then for starters, we'll do no line. And then we'll add a line in a second. So K for black, O, the letter O for circles. So this is going to print it now with a bunch of individual markers, but it's not going to draw a line in between them. So I'll hit run. And we'll take a look at it, see what, see what it's doing. OK, so you can see, oh, I changed the resolution on everything. So that's why it looks terrible right now. But um, actually, hold on a second. Let me, let me fix this so we can see what we're doing a little better. I'm going to take these plots out and hit run. OK, so now our plot for our sine curve is black circles. And they're at every. Uh, pi over 3. So they're every 60 degrees, basically, as we go through here. Now, if we wanted to draw lines in between them, we can go back to our formatting specifier here. So I said black and O. Now, if I want to put a line in between them, if I want it to just be a solid line, I put a hyphen. But we have other choices. A single hyphen gives you a solid line. Uh, two hyphens give you a dashed line. 
a hyphen and a period give you dashes, alternating dashes and dots. And then a colon will give you a dotted line. So I'll show you all of them. I'll show you a couple of them. We'll start with the solid line, which we've actually already seen, but might as well see it again. So now my points are connected by a solid line. Um, I could make them connected by a dashed line instead by putting two hyphens. I'll hit run, we'll see it again with two hyphens. See, now you've got the dashed line. You can do alternating dashes and dots in our line. Then it'll look like that. Or we could do a full just dotted line. The specifier for that's a colon. Yeah. So again, we can change our resolution. Things like that. I like the dot dash line, so we'll take a look at that one more time. Then you can also you can leave off any of these specifiers here. Whoops. I did it. So you don't have to specify a line type. If you don't specify a line type, there won't be a line. Uh, you don't have to specify a point type. If you leave off the point type, you won't have the individual point markers. And if you don't specify the color, it'll pick, MATLAB will pick one for you. And when MATLAB picks colors for you, each line you add to the plot gets a different color. So if you want all your lines to be the same color, you need to specify a color. All right. So again, any questions? So this is in your packet as well. OK, so here's just a few rules for your, uh, for your line plotting. Um, when you're plotting x and y, you have to have the same number of values in your x and your y vectors. So uh, this kind of shows you a couple of ways you could draw them out. So you could have uh, 2 and 5. Let me back up a second, just because I don't really like what I'm looking at here. Um, when you're making plots of x and y, you need to have the same number of x's as you have y's. If you leave off the x values and just plot the y values, MATLAB will automatically fill in integer values starting at 1 for your x values. So if that's fine, you don't have to provide x values. If you want your x values to be something other than integer values starting at 1, then you need to provide them. So you have to provide the same number of x values as you have y values every time. Otherwise, it won't work. You do not have to specify a plot format. MATLAB, will, MATLAB is a default. It's a solid blue line with no point markers. If that's what you want to see, that's what you're going to get if you don't specify any kind of formatting. And that's fine. Um, again, if you, if you plot more than one line in the same plot, in the same, uh, same figure window, on the same set of axes, then MATLAB will choose colors for you, and it'll choose different ones for each thing. Um, you can have markers without lines. I just showed you that. You also don't need you don't need to specify a marker. If you don't specify a marker type, you won't get one for each point. You'll just get your lines, but so you don't have to specify any of that. Again, the order that you put your formatting in doesn't matter. So you can do uh, you know, color, marker, line type, line type, color, marker, whatever order you want. One of the few things where MATLAB doesn't make you follow a hard and fast rule. 
There's also a long-handed way that you can specify color, line style, marker, and all that kind of stuff too. So this is available as well if you want to type it out longhand. I usually don't. I like to type, I like to keep things short because um, the more I type, the more likely I am to make a mistake. That's the plotting rules. Ah, so let's talk about labeling our axes. Labels and titles. These are all good things to have on here. So let's um, let's make some labels. So we'll go back to our sine cosine plot here. I'm actually going to comment out these earlier plots just because it's slowing things down. So we don't have to wait for any of these to happen. Let's make our plot here. I'm going to just kind of put this back to nice looking stuff here. Um, I'm no longer going to use any markers, but I do want that first plot to be black dot dash line. Everything else I'll let just fall by default. So let's give this a run, see what it all looks like, make sure it looks cool. Okay, that all looks cool. So now I want to put some labels on here. So you could do that in the command window if you want to. Let's say we want to give it a title. So let's say I'm going to call it some trig, real creative title. So now we look at my figure. We've got a title on here, some trig. And we want to label our x and y axes. So we can do that as well. Um, we'll do that down here. Now, by the way, when you're doing titles and labels and things, you have to do that after you make your first plot. So if you have no plot in your window, you can't put any titles or labels yet. So the title and label command has to come after the plot command. So in general, the order goes like this. Figure command first, then the plot command, and then any other commands to modify your plot, like adding titles, adding labels, things like that. So I'll add my title here. Trig. Then we can label our axes. So our x axis, the, the command for labeling the x axis is x label. And then in parentheses, single quotes, you type in what your label should be. So this is going to be angle in radians. That's my x label. Can anybody guess what the command for the Y label is going to be? I'll give you a hint. It's the same command, except it's called Y label instead of X label. So our Y label is going to be, um, well, I guess this is a sine or a cosine or a whatever. So we'll just call it uh, the trig. Okay, so when I hit run on these now, we should have a nicely labeled plot. So we've got a title, we've got an X label, we've got a Y label. Pretty cool. That's really all there is to it for, for labels and titles and things. We're going to come back to subplot later. A lot of this stuff is reference material. Like keeping this packet handy whenever you're making plots is a good idea. I recommend, um, so what I used to do when we got to have class in person is I'd print this out for everybody and hand it out to the class and say, you know, keep this. You'll need it for the rest of this class and for 3,800. And it probably wouldn't hurt to have it around in senior design also. Um, now that I don't get to see you in person, I don't get to print it for you, but um, keep the PDF and run a print on it if you, you know, have a printer handy. Um, print it double-sided, save some paper, but keep it. This is going to be useful. You'll be able to use it for lots of things, lots of good reference material in here. So, um,
here's where I wanted to get to. I wanted to get to the legend. So you can put a legend on your plot to identify what each of their lines is supposed to be. The way the legend works, the command for it is legend. And then inside the parentheses, you list off the name of each, uh, each plot that you made. You make it in the same order that you made the plots. So the first plot you make gets the first label. The second plot you make gets the second label. Third plot gets the third label. If you have 50 plots, you label them one at a time in order, in the same order that you create them. So going back to our script here, we created three plots. We have a plot of the sine, plot of the cosine, and plot of sine 2x. So I'm going to create my legend now. The command is legend. And then we list off each one. So sine x. Oh, and each label goes in its own set of single quotes, and they're separated by commas. Cosine x, sine 2x. Those are going to be my labels. That's the simplest form of setting up a legend. So we hit run again, and it'll reprint our plot, and we'll get to see what it looks like with the legend. So see, here's our legend here. Now, you can control where that legend is going to show up in your plot. So right now, where it's showing up, it's covering some of my, um, some of my lines, and I don't want that to happen. So what I can do is I can move it. So back to the legend command. And this is all, you can find this in your uh, plotting packet as well. This is the next part. Now we can um, set the location and the orientation. So the location you can set based on compass direction. So north is the top, south is the bottom, east is left, west is right. And you can put it in the corners, northeast, southeast, northwest, southwest. So I want to put it in the southwest corner. So here's how I would specify that in my legend command here. So after I list all of my labels, put in another comma, and then in single quotes, type the word location. Spell it correctly. I didn't. And then another comma. Now we can specify our location. It's written in camel case, which camel case means uh, you have a capital letter in the middle somewhere. So capital S, south, capital W, west, no space. And this should move my, um, move my legend. So right now my legend's up here in the northeast corner. It's going to move it down to the southwest corner, which is blank, and it'll be easier to read. So I'll hit run, and we'll see what that looks like. See, there it is. Now we've moved the legend to a different location. OK. The other thing you can do, you can, so if you're using, you don't get this if you're using Octave, by the way. But you do get this if you're using MATLAB. You can specify, instead of specifying north, south, east, west, all that, you can specify best. And that'll let MATLAB figure out where to put it, where the best place to put it is. Uh, personally, so uh, when Dr. Lopez did this, uh, lecture, she put the, this is recommended using best. Uh, personally, for me, I like to be in control of things. So I usually set my own location. But you know, best works just fine. It's pretty good, actually. Um, but you know, run it, try it, see what it does. If you don't like it, set your own location. Um, the other location values that we can put in here are the same compass directions, but you can throw the word outside on the end. What outside does is it puts the legend outside of the outside of your axes instead of inside on top. The other part here is orientation. You can make it vertical or horizontal. Default is vertical. Horizontal will uh, put it across the bottom in this case. So I'll add that on here just to show you what it looks like. So orientation, horizontal. Hit run, and we'll see what it looks like. I already know I don't like it, but I want to show you what it does. See, it makes it a horizontal instead of a vertical list. I think it looks crappy, but you know, depending on what you're doing, maybe it looks better. 
for this for this plot it looks terrible so i don't like it so i'm going to take that out you can do or orientation vertical instead and then it'll look cooler okay so we're running out of time here but uh i do recommend thumbing through this uh this set of notes. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Um, some talk about bar plots. Um, also saving. Let's uh, take just a minute at the end here to talk saving before I throw you out of here. I know I'm running over by um, a minute here. Um, the PDF is saved on the Canvas page. It's under resources. So if you go to the main Canvas page, click resources, this is on there. I'll also put it on the uh, recordings of online classes page. So you'll be able to find it from there too. But right now it's just on resources. Okay, last thing I want to say before I cut you loose. Uh, when you create a figure, if you want to save it, go in your figure window here. And you can go to file. And there's a bunch of options here. Um, I'll go straight to save as. So when you save as, it will eventually bring up your save window. The default file type is a .fig file. There's not much you can do with a .fig file. So don't save as a .fig. Click on, the, on this thing where it says files of type. It'll look a little bit different in Windows, but pretty close. Uh, click on that. It might be called format. And just pull down this list and pick something other than fig. Um, bitmaps take a lot of space. But it's a good, it's a perfectly good file format um, to create smaller files. JPEGs are good. Um, I like PNGs a lot. PNG is a good file format. Um, PDF is even better. PDF is a vector format. Vector formats are good because they take up less space and they're scalable. So I can zoom in and everything still looks good. Versus if you use a JPEG or a PNG, if you zoom in, you start you start getting pixelated. Um, but basically any of these file formats, except for the first one, are good. Pick one that you've heard of. Your digital camera on your phone saves JPEGs. So uh, that's saving. Once you do that, you know, pick a pick a pick a file type. I'll go with PNGs because I like them. Give it a name and hit save. And that's it. That's how you save your files. So if you want to create a figure and then save it and turn it in, that's how you would do such a thing.